question. So it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Downs, um, the Southern Regional Representative for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, also the board chair of the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance, who's gonna moderate this next session. So Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Randy, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to moderate this session. This is one of the ones that I've personally been looking forward to uh, the most here at the National Wilderness Workshop um, about you know, wilderness stewardship and advocacy in the Shenandoah Mountain Campaign, which is just right around the corner from me. And really lucky to have uh, Lynn, Cam Lynn Cameron and Tom Engel uh, here presenting it with us today. Uh, Lynn Cameron is the past president and current board member of the Virginia Wilderness Committee and co-chair of Friends of Shenandoah Mountain, which is a working coalition formed by wilderness advocates and mountain bike leaders to build public support for the proposed Shenandoah Mountain National Scenic Area. Um, and Tom, as I mentioned, Tom has been a member of the board of the Virginia Wilderness Committee since 2018. And from 20, or 1986 to 2017, was a Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State, uh, serving in a variety of uh, different assignments. Um, Tom's also a member of the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club and a trail maintainer on Shenandoah Mountain. And I think this is a really great opportunity um, to talk about the, the role of partnerships um, in this type of advocacy work. One of the things here um, and, and in and around the AP and around the East, it's in other parts of the country, partnerships are so critical in, in moving the ball forward. And I think this is a great example of, of a really good collaborative um, that that all uh, everybody can can take a little nugget from it at very least. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Lynn and um, thank both of our presenters. Thank you very much, Andrew, and hi, everyone. I'm Tom Engel, and uh, today Lynn and I are going to be continuing this discussion about how wilderness stewardship has interacted with policy advocacy in the campaign to establish a large national scenic area with four embedded wilderness areas on Shenandoah Mountain in Western Virginia. I want to thank the Wilderness Stewardship Alliance for giving us this opportunity and for all the great work that you all do. I'm a relative newcomer to the campaign, having worked on it in the three plus years since I joined the board of the Virginia Wilderness Committee. In contrast, Lynn Cameron is one of the originators of the proposal to protect these lands. She's been the driving force to realize the proposal over some 30 years, and she continues to lead the ongoing campaign. So I hope you don't hear any discrepancies between what I say and what she says today, but if you do, go with her version. After briefly stating our central message, we will describe the context, both regional, political, and natural historical, uh, in which the Shenandoah Mountain campaign was launched and executed, the basic features of the National Scenic Area proposal, key features of the campaign plan that evolved to advocate for the proposal, how early and growing wilderness stewardship helped the campaign achieve the success it has so far, and how the success of that advocacy has in turn promoted additional stewardship. Organizationally, we represent and have worked uh, mainly through three groups to execute this campaign though many other partners have also supported the effort. The Virginia Wilderness Committee has a track record of advocating for and securing legislation to establish wilderness and other types of protected areas statewide. VWC and the Wilderness Society established the Friends of Shenandoah Mountain, along with allies in the mountain biking community to raise awareness of this resource and build support for the specific National Scenic Area and Wilderness proposal. And PATC, of course, provides structure and capacity to volunteer trail maintenance efforts and has increased its involvement over the years on the western side of the Shenandoah Valley. Hand in glove, virtuous circle, the saw cuts in both directions, Pick your favorite metaphor. 
we hope to convince you today of the validity of our two-pronged thesis, namely that volunteer wilderness stewardship has helped this campaign achieve the success it has to date, and that growing awareness of the campaign and its progress has in turn generated more stewardship. And one caveat here at the outset, we will be talking today about the successes of the campaign, uh, but we're obviously not there yet. Congress has not yet designated New Wilderness or a scenic area on Shenandoah Mountain, and no bill has yet been introduced to accomplish that, though we hope we're getting close on new legislation. This has been and continues to be a patient, long-term effort. We don't think the fact that we have not yet achieved final success diminishes the validity of our thesis about the importance of stewardship. And now I'll pass it over to Lynn to describe the context in which the campaign was launched and executed. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, uh, in talking about the context um, for Shenandoah Mountain, um, what we see there is an area that has very high value for protection. Um, it has, it's um, long been a prime candidate of the Virginia Wilderness Committee for wilderness designation for several decades uh, and for good reason. Uh, it's one of the largest tracts of unfragmented forest land on national forest uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, the central part of Shenandoah Mountain has five inventoried roadless areas, uh, and one of them is the largest in the east. That's the Little River roadless area at 28,000 acres. Uh, the area is part of the Southern Appalachian Mountains and therefore has very rich biodiversity. Uh, uh, the whole area was clear cut around the turn of the century, pretty much all of it, uh, but it's recovered well and now it's a, a large block of mature forest, healthy forest that provides habitat for many species. Um, it has uh, the, a water uh, resource that's of regional importance. Um, the uh, cold water mountain streams uh, are, provide excellent habitat for native brook trout, but it also provides communities, towns, cities downstream with clean uh, municipal water. It's one of the higher parts of Virginia with uh, 10 peaks above 4,000 feet. And you can see uh, this, the scenic beauty is certainly there. And uh, this large block with almost no roads in it has great opportunities for solitude. Um, another reason it's a good candidate for protection is because there's a threat and that is that the, the whole uh, Shenandoah Mountain area is underlain by Marcellus Shale, and therefore uh, the land could be leased in the future for natural gas developments uh, by fracking. So that, that puts uh, some uh, importance, some added importance to protection of this area. Now let's take a look at uh, another aspect of the context, and that's the high resistance to wilderness designation in particular. Um, it's the other side of the coin, I'm afraid. Uh, back in the 1990s, when Virginia Wilderness Committee first sought uh, wilderness designation for this area, we ran into a lot of resistance. Um, there were a lot of, there were misconceptions, misinformation, those travel like wildfire, of course, but also the local governments passed resolution after resolution against wilderness. Uh, mountain biking was becoming more popular on Shenandoah Mountain in the 90s, and so that was a challenge. Um, hunters wanted to see more management, game managers did too, and the timber industry, uh, this was pre the roadless area rule, saw opportunities to cut timber on Shenandoah Mountain. And a lot of uh, different interests were just afraid of road closures and loss of access. I remember um, during our early 90s campaign, uh, some groups put out petitions in local stores uh, along the base of Shenandoah Mountain and they were able to gather 5,600 signatures against any wilderness in Rockingham County. And then the Rockingham County Board of Supervisors held a public meeting at the base of the mountain. And uh, there were about 200 angry bear hunters there. Uh, 
and they were just yelling, we don't want any wilderness. Now I'm hearing from earlier presentations that bear hunters have become more enlightened and we have found that to be true in our area too. But back in the nineties, they were very much against wilderness designation. They said, we don't want wilderness. We want to keep it like it is. And we were thinking to ourselves, the five of us who were wilderness advocates at this meeting, uh, well, this is a way you could do that. But uh, we had a long way to go to achieve that. I will say I'll never forget that night with the, the angry bear hunters at the public meeting. So, um, so we have this high value and uh, high resistance. As far as the high value, you can see from this map produced by the Nature Conservancy, they did an inventory of biodiversity hotspots across the nation. And uh, Virginia has a certain richness, uh, the whole Southern Appalachians and Shenandoah Mountain lies within one of these uh, red biodiversity hotspots that have the highest uh, biodiversity. Uh, you know, wilderness truly is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? When I think of wilderness, I think of a beautiful forest like this, uh, very little uh, impact of man, opportunities for solitude. I think of rich biodiversity, uh, beautiful wildflowers, and um, just uh, a, great a great place to experience nature at its finest and its fullest. But I've learned that not everybody sees wilderness that way. In our early days, I think uh, a lot of people s saw it more like this. It's a place full of restrictions. Uh, what they thought anyway was that roads would be closed. That wasn't actually true. But uh, that you couldn't hunt, that you couldn't even set foot in wilderness. Human beings were not allowed there. That trails couldn't be maintained. And if people got lost in the wilderness, you couldn't rescue them. You couldn't fight fire. You couldn't fight pests or disease. And that really wilderness was just a way to lock up the forest and keep everybody out. Well, if, uh, if I, and to top it all off, you couldn't even use power tools like chainsaws in wilderness. Um, if all this were true, who would who in the world would even be for wilderness? So we, we realized back in the 90s, we had a lot of work to do to win over the local governments and the local people. Uh, I think it, it's helpful to, to consider Ramsey's draft uh, wilderness. Eric Giebelstein mentioned it earlier. It's the only part of Shenandoah Mountain that's currently protected through wilderness designation designated in 84, and as Eric mentioned, it has a, a virgin hemlock forest. Uh, and so that was a special resource that everyone recognized and appreciated. But in the 90s, the woolly Adelgids moved in and started killing those hemlocks, and they have, have been falling down now for a long time and still are. And the Forest Service really, uh, during those 90s and uh, after 2000, their capacity was declining to deal with trails in anywhere, but especially in wilderness where you had special problems like this. Um, they just didn't have the capacity and volunteer groups had not stepped in to do the job. So um, what we saw in Ramsey's draft were trails that were really uh, pretty much impassable. When these big giants fell, they were hard to, to cross. And um, See, people blamed this situation on wilderness designation. They thought that the Forest Service let this happen because it's wilderness, that if it weren't wilderness, the Forest Service would have done something. So uh, that was just plain wrong. And we, we tried to straighten that out by explaining that it was actually the wo woolly adelgid that killed the trees, not the Forest Service or the wilderness designation. Uh, and that the Forest Service didn't have resources for widespread treatment anywhere, whether it was wilderness or not. Um, but basically what the public saw as the face of wilderness on Shenandoah Mountain was something almost impenetrable and with no volunteers or agency uh, help to, uh, to make it more inviting to the public. So, um, Eric mentioned some of these things earlier, so I won't dwell on them, but 
Ramsey's draft is not real big. It's 6,500 acres, but some of the, uh, the largest old growth have fallen down in the most remote areas. And it could be a 10 mile hike just to get to those round trip and 34 stream crossings. And with the vegetation, uh, with more light hitting the forest floor with all those big trees down, you have lots of briars and uh, stinging nettle and things like that. So um, it was quite a challenge, but there were volunteers in the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, the local Shenandoah Valley chapter, that, that did the best they could to work on Ramsey's draft and to, um, but, but it was a, a big challenge for us. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Tom to talk about the basic Shenandoah Mountain National Scenic Area proposal. Thank you, Lynn. So the proposal that, that Lynn and others developed is to designate about 90,000 acres along Shenandoah Mountain as a national scenic area. And within that ter territory, four new wilderness areas totaling about 28,000 acres. The entire tract is already part of the George Washington National Forest. So the red line that's kind of barely visible there, uh, that shows Shenandoah Mountain. The white line roughly shows Shenandoah National Park along the Blue Ridge. Don't confuse the names. And the yellow oval shows the Shenandoah Valley between these two Appalachian ridges. That's the big picture. We're zooming in a little bit here. So this slide shows uh, the GW National Forest. The GW is the largest national forest in the eastern United States and has the largest roadless areas and the most roadless areas. So that red line shows the 72 mile long Shenandoah Mountain and the yellow line, sorry, the yellow oval roughly shows the area covered by the proposal. There are five roadless areas, as Lynn mentioned. This map shows roadless areas and existing wilderness areas in our region. The proposal would increase total wilderness area by almost two thirds. This map also shows uh, some of the nearby cities. Rivers starting in the proposal area provide municipal water supplies to the cities of Harrisonburg and Stanton and the surrounding rural areas and protection of water supplies has been one of our key selling points to build regional support. Zooming in further, we see the proposed 90,000 acre national scenic area in the teal color and the four proposed new wilderness areas in the brownish orange as well as the existing Ramsey's Draft Wilderness in dark green in the, the lower left of the map. Almost a third of the proposal area would be newly designated wilderness. These boundaries are a result of a great deal of collaboration and compromise. Wilderness boundaries were drawn to keep most trails open to mountain bikes, for example. This was key to our successful collaboration with the bikers. Boundaries were also adjusted to support more management for wildlife around the periphery of the proposal. And this was key to gaining the support of the hunting organizations, game managers, and timber industry. Turning now to the main features of the advocacy campaign that Lynn and others developed, the basic approach was a patient effort to prepare the local and regional ground to overcome the opposition that Lynn described before pursuing national legislation. Preparing the regional ground meant building the widest possible coalition of forest stakeholders to support the proposal. This began with outreach to mountain bikers, stressing their common interests with conservationists in preserving and protecting the resource. Similarly, Proponents collaborated with timber interests, game managers, and hunting organizations. They described the benefits of the proposal in countless interactions and enlisted endorsements from hundreds of local businesses, civic organizations, and faith groups. 
Having mobilized such a broad coalition of interests, we were in good position to seek support from the Forest Service and city and county governments, whose endorsements were always seen as prerequisites to securing national legislation. The campaign was thus based on balancing conservation, recreation, broadly defined to include hikers, bikers, and equestrians, and timber management, game management, and hunting interests. So a big broad church was, was the theory and the practice here. The recommendation to the Forest Service embodied this balance. It was based on the idea that the forest is big enough to allow timber management where appropriate to support good game populations while still protecting core forested areas. This approach paid off in 2014 when the Forest Service recommended adoption of the Shenandoah Mountain National Scenic Area and two of the four proposed wilderness areas in its management plan for the GW National Forest. And while the focus was local and regional, advocates did also keep supportive congressional staff in Washington informed of their progress. This may be the only photograph known to exist that shows Mark Miller wearing a suit and tie. In addition to demonstrating that some admittedly strange bedfellows could work together to protect public lands, these were some of the arguments that resonated with initially skeptical regional audiences. Capitalizing on growing stewardship was an important aspect of this. We posted photos of our efforts on social media and sent press releases to local newspapers. We did interviews for radio and newspapers. And now Lynn, back to you to elaborate on how stewardship supported the advocacy effort. Thank you, Tom. Um, our two-pronged thesis that wilderness stewardship helps advocacy efforts and advocacy excuse me, advocacy helps increase stewardship is so tightly woven together that it's hard to pry apart into two pieces. I'm going to try to talk about how stewardship helped our advocacy. Um, we made presentations to literally scores of organizations over a period of about 20 years, and during that time our thinking evolved and our messages changed a bit. Uh, instead of just providing facts to counter uh, misperceptions, we started um, just tweaking our message a bit. Uh, instead of being deprived of the use of chainsaws in wilderness, we were keeping the traditional skills of our forefathers alive today. The audiences in the Shenandoah Valley um, really appreciated tradition and history and also caring for the land. And so by being out there working in the forest, removing blowdowns or clipping vegetation, whatever we did, we were being stewards. And so wilderness was not just being neglected, it was being cared for. And that was, in, that was something important for them to hear. And we also emphasized the history of the Shenandoah Mountain area and that really resonated. And then we respected the traditional uses, hunting and fishing and uh, we're able to show how being good stewards enabled those and, and helped, helped hunters and fishermen. I think the fact that we were out there on the ground uh, doing work helped us gain credibility and uh, show that we had some skin in the game. Uh, audiences really appreciated our work and they were intrigued by our methods and they saw us having fun uh, in the photos we, we would share. Um, so I think we were able to connect with some former skeptics and opponents through including this stewardship aspect to our educational efforts. Uh, one story I like to tell is uh, White's, about White's Wayside, a restaurant at the base of uh, Shenandoah Mountain. During COVID, I asked them uh, if we could gather there for a, a work trip and they um, called their staff in, their restaurant was closed. All we wanted to do was park there, but they called their uh, cooks in and uh, said, um, we want to provide lunch for everybody. So we'll have a bag of lunch ready for you when you, when you meet here. 
Well, they had endorsed the proposal. And in fact, um, I had met um, an Augusta County supervisor there after a full day's work trip at White's Wayside so that I could tell her about the proposal. Well, the restaurant owners pulled a chair up and sat down and said, do you mind if we join in the conversation? And they helped me make the pitch. And the supervisor uh, became our champion in Augusta County for the, uh, the proposal. So that was, I, I thought, well, is this appropriate? I'm all sweaty and dirty and, you know, my hard hat and everything, but um, it worked. So um, we had the best roast beef sandwich uh, the day that they provided our lunch that I've ever had, much better than our usual peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, still, we had a small uh, group of people trying to do a big job. And then one day, Eric Giebelstein called me and said, told me about SAWS and uh, said they were moving into Virginia and we developed a relationship. And first thing you know, we had a crew of uh, US Naval Academy um, workers, volunteers uh, in Ramsey's draft for eight days. It, it felt like the cavalry had come when uh, Saul's moved to Virginia. They could go to those most remote areas. They had the skills, the training, uh, the Saul's staff had the certification necessary to get the job done. It gave us such a boost. And they also helped us just do a better job of recruiting volunteers, training them, and, and just building capacity in general. I can't say enough about SAWS, and I know they'll be saying more later, Bill Meadows will, uh, so I won't steal the thunder, and Eric's already told you some, but every time they came to Ramsey's draft, uh, he would invite me to come and give a talk to the uh, the midshipmen uh, about our campaign. So we were, I felt like that was just a nice touch. We even carried melons and peaches and other fruit to the, to the crew so they would have some fresh fruit at the end of the week and told them about our campaign. These are tomorrow's leaders. So this was a very nice uh, connection. So uh, our, our little Shenandoah Valley chapter, we did the best we could on a small scale. Uh, starting around 2009 and just gradually expanded our capacity by reaching out to others for help. And uh, it, it did help to have a presence there, even though it was small, it, it was growing. And uh, in, around 2019 or a little earlier, we started reaching out to local governments uh, for resolutions of support. We already had over 400 organizations and businesses and we thought, well, it's time. And uh, you can see in this uh, chart uh, where these each local government stood in the early 90s and then where they shifted to in uh, 2019 to today. City of Stanton had always liked wilderness, so no change there. But Augusta County had uh, multiple anti-wilderness resolutions, but they ended up voting six out of seven in favor of the Shenandoah Mountain proposal with wilderness. And they had the most wilderness of any county to gain. Uh, Rockingham County, where we had the 5,600 signatures against and the bear hunter, uh, angry bear hunters at Briary Branch, um, they approved the proposal unanimously. And the city of Harrisonburg also unanimous approval. Uh, Highland County, we've had conversations with them and there, there's a, a resolution has been drafted but they haven't voted yet. So this was a pretty dramatic shift but it did take some time and some work. But I can tell you the stewardship did play a role in this. Every one of those local governments wanted to know what about trails? Is anybody going to maintain them? Will they be closed down in wilderness? well, it's just terrible, you can't use chainsaws. So we were able to address their concerns and not just to give them a promise of what might happen in the future. Oh yes, people can maintain trails. People are maintaining trails. It's already happening. And, uh, and it really made a difference to them and they wanted language in their resolutions about um, the stewardship that was happening by multiple groups. And so now I'm going to, um, turn it back over to Tom to talk about the second uh, prong of our thesis. Yeah, we're convinced that 
publicity about the campaign and progress toward its goal have helped mobilize additional stewardship efforts by diverse groups of volunteers. Uh, these next few slides give a few examples of, of what has been a very gratifying trend. Here you see uh, SAWS and AmeriCorps. I think that's maybe Braley Pond in the background. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn. Um, <clears throat> We wanted to get as many different groups in on the action as possible. Uh, as Lynn has said, uh, SAWS has been a leader in helping to channel increased volunteer activity in productive directions. The age span in this group was two years old to 82 years old. Wild East Women organized a work trip in Ramsey's Draft Wilderness to cut back briars and vegetation. And that's a view from the, uh, the uh, Confederate breastworks there at Route 250, I think. We reached out to student groups from James Madison University. These are geographic science club students who help both with trail work and with mapping. We're going to go quickly through uh, some of these examples to make, try to make the point uh, that, that, you know, Stewardship was both a cause and an effect here. Uh, <clears throat> the Forest Service provided a tool shed and enough PPP for all our volunteers. And a SAWS board member made an extremely generous donation of crosscut saws, katana boys, axes, wedges, and other equipment, all of which gets very intensive use by trail maintainers. After a decade of persistent effort by its small Southern Shenandoah Valley chapter, PATC expanded its official involvement on the Western side of the Shenandoah Valley in 2019 by signing a group volunteer agreement with the Forest Service to organize volunteer trail maintenance services on Shenandoah Mountain. And that's what a volunteer service agreement looks like. In recognition of PATC's region-wide stewardship efforts, the Forest Service presented the club with the prestigious Enduring Service Award in 2018. The nomination included uh, the, the, the Southern uh, Shenandoah Valley chapter's efforts in the Shenandoah Mountain area. And I'm very proud to say that volunteers in PATC's North River District now lead the entire club in trail maintainer hours. Coordinators like Lynn have had good success in enlisting new volunteers, further evidence of the expansion and stewardship in this region. Some volunteers joined PATC so that they could become trail maintainers, having heard about the wilderness and NSA campaign and wanting to help out with it. The National Scenic Area proposal helps trail maintainers feel like they're contributing to the goal of protecting more wilderness in the region. In only two years since PATC signed its agreement with the Forest Service, club volunteers are maintaining 90 miles of trail in the North River District, including all wilderness and proposed wilderness trails. So it's really been a, a rapid, uh, rapid successful effort there. Friends of Shenandoah Mountain partnered with the Virginia Master Naturalists, both in stewardship and education about the outstanding biodiversity of the area. They sponsor annual wildflower walks, mushroom walks, geology walks, bird walks, and more. Been a very productive collaboration. And we think the quality as well as the quantity of stewardship is increasing as exemplified by this group of trail maintainers who, again, thanks to SAWS, received cross-cut saw training and certification. And your two humble co-presenters today are both in the picture.
And volunteer stewardship has received a good bit of positive media attention in the region. Here's a couple of examples of that from uh, the recorder that's based in very far Western Virginia, serving Bath, Highland and Allegheny counties. And then and to wrap up this part, uh, we just wanted to recognize a couple of especially hardworking volunteer trail maintainers. The Orndorfs, Roger and Jan, have gone above and beyond the call of duty, working some 600 hours in the past year and a half to maintain their very remote section of trail. If we all kept their pace, you wouldn't see any blowdowns in uh, Ramsey's Draft or, or anywhere else on Shenandoah Mountain. So they are, they are models for us all. And now back to Lynn, who's gonna wrap up our presentation. Thanks, Tom. I'd like to uh, just put in another comment about the benefit of spending time in the wilderness doing work. Um, I met Roger uh, while going in to get a blowdown in Ramsey's draft. Just, he was just sitting by the trail. He was trying out a new backpack and it led to all this work that he and his wife have done. I also met Tom Engel in Ramsey's draft wilderness when he came on a hike that my husband and I led. And uh, so that uh, eventually led to his being on, joining the Virginia Wilderness uh, Committee Board and becoming a trail maintainer and uh, helping with Friends of Shenandoah Mountain. And now he's even a master naturalist. So um, it's very dangerous to go hiking in the wilderness, I guess. Um, well, I just wanted to uh, take a minute to review our campaign strategy. Um, we've come a long way collaborating with the mountain bikers and creating Friends of Shenandoah Mountain. Um, it was good to have this unity throughout this campaign with the mountain bikers. And then uh, getting uh, more than 400 endorsements from businesses and organizations, that involved a lot of door-to-door -door work and a lot of presentations. Uh, and um, Mark Miller initiated the collaboration with the timber uh, industry, the game managers and the hunting organizations back in 2011, 2012. That took two years. And that um, downsized our proposal, but gained tremendous support that was uh, very important uh, politically. Um, and then we were able to get most of what we wanted um, recommended by the, uh, the forest plan. And we've got the most of the city and county government resolutions in place. So we are ready. We have done, we think uh, 20 years has been enough preparation. Uh, we've got things in place that should be in place. And so uh, now we're ready to move forward. Um, and there's no one key to the success of this campaign. There are so many things that have helped, but we definitely think that stewardship has contributed to our political success and that political success has helped us to um, engage more volunteers in stewardship. And I think this has all been beneficial to the Forest Service as the managers of the land, because we can be their eyes and ears in the wilderness areas. They don't have staff or capacity to do this themselves. And so we have a very uh, a, a partnership that we uh, place a high value on with the Forest Service. Um, so, um, we do think that wilderness stewardship is political power and that advocating for wilderness increases volunteer stewardship. I wanted to share a story. Um, I ran into a bear hunter within the last year when I was doing trail work uh, in Ramsey's draft and he pulled out a tattered copy of our Shenandoah Mountain brochure and he said, do you know anything about this? And I said, well, yeah, a little. And he said, well, We've been looking at this and we think it, that this wilderness uh, designation is gonna be good for bear hunting. And I just nodded and said, I think you're right. Um, so we've, we've seen some changes in attitudes. We've seen it's helped our campaign. We think that this firsthand experience in the wilderness, for one thing has increased our in-depth on the ground knowledge. And so when we go out talking to hunters or any, anybody in the community, 
we know what we're talking about. We know the lay of the land. We know what's there. And uh, it, it just helps us relate to other forest users and define common ground with them. We all care about the forest. We may have different reasons, but, but there is common ground there. And for me personally, being in the wilderness and taking care of it helps me stay motivated and energized. Uh, so even after legislation's passed, the campaign may end, but the stewardships and efforts on Shenandoah Mountain will continue. And uh, we'll, we'll keep recruiting more volunteers and nurturing them. And we're going to enjoy every minute of taking care of, care of this area that we've worked so hard to protect. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to share our experience with you. Well, thank you both. Um, that was an excellent presentation. And I just want to thank you guys for all the work you're doing on Shenandoah Mountain and also um, also for presenting today. So imagine just a giant room of people clapping for you at this point. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, I think first, um, and then I have a question. I think first came in from Bill um, and was specific to the recent Virginia election and how you feel like that may impact the path uh, towards success. Um, and then maybe, maybe expand that question a little bit. And um, over the 20 years that this campaign's been underway, talk about how um, you guys weather the storms created through changes of administration or um, the, you know, the sort of political winds that, winds that may um, impact uh, your partnerships um, one way or the other. Well, I'd be happy to take a stab at that. Um, you know, actually the political winds haven't, had, haven't made that much difference uh, in our campaign. We've always been very nonpartisan and uh, we've, we have strong supporters on both sides of the aisle um, locally. And uh, so we just, we find common ground with those we work with and uh, we just don't pay too much attention to who's in, who, who the leaders are at any given time because our whole campaign has been very locally focused. And uh, so I, I think, you know, We've been able to make progress no matter who's who's the president or who's the governor. And I hope, hope that will continue. Sounds like a, a, a strategic approach almost at the beginning was to was to be nonpartisan and, and to focus on kind of both sides of the aisle as a as in part a way to kind of be able to weather those storms. Um, so good on you for 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 that sort of smart thinking early on. Um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about what the initial types of um, conversations were with the mountain bike community. How did you identify leaders there? What were, what were the sort of initial steps specific to working with mountain bikers um, to gain trust and to gain uh, a shared willingness to work together? Mm -hmm. Well, uh Back around 2000, we decided we wanted to try a second time to protect the area. And when we looked at the uh, what was going on, that um, there was an article in the Washington Post that said Shenandoah Mountain was some of the best mountain biking in the eastern United States. And, and we just thought, I don't see how this can work. So our options were we could give up or we could reach out and we decided to reach out. And so uh, we identified some mountain bike leaders. Um, and um, I remember going into a Shenandoah Bicycle Company's shop and, and uh, introducing myself to Thomas Jenkins, who, the owner there, and uh, one of the early leaders and uh, developers of the Shenandoah Valley Bicycle Coalition. And I just said, uh, uh, we both care about this area. Uh, can we work together to protect it? And Thomas was very receptive. And we started meeting uh, the Virginia Wilderness Committee led by uh, Bart Kohler of uh, the Wilderness Support Group, started meeting uh, in 02 and we met for th three years. Well, it wasn't actually one three year long meeting, but we met periodically for three years. And uh, 
it was difficult at first and we had to have difficult conversations, but we did find common ground and the, the people on both sides were reasonable and we realized that compromise was necessary and that being true to our word was necessary, you know, was important. And uh, so we were able to come up with a, a, a proposal that had wilderness in it and that uh, the mountain bikers could support. Um, we did draw, as Tom mentioned, the boundaries to keep most of the trails open. And another significant thing we didn't mention was we agreed to adjust the boundary, the Western boundary of Ramsey's Draft Wilderness to open up Shenandoah Mountain Trail uh, as a multi-use trail. And that was a very important thing to the mountain bike community. And so we have uh, kept our promises to each other. And uh, Thomas Jenkins and I became the co-chairs of Friends of Shenandoah Mountain when it was formed. And I think that was really a, a smart move, which was Bart's idea, Bart Kohler, to keep us working together so that we uh, share leadership of the the campaign. Yeah, that is, that's really interesting. A good, um, good piece of information. Um, any other questions out there? You can just pop them into the chat. Get your guys, or if you're not monitoring the chat, Tom and Lynn, getting a bunch of high fives. Uh, and thanks for um, the presentation and the work. So I want to pass those along. Um, but not seeing any more questions here. So I'll bring yeah, back. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, I'll bring questions back in range. put into the Q&A. So, Andrew, questions can be put into the Q&A for those the folks in the audience. Just use the Q&A feature, uh, queue up your questions, and I'm sure that Lynn and Tom and, and Andrew would be glad to respond. Yeah, Randy, I, I, I did uh, I did tell ask people to do that via the chat. We've addressed the two questions in the Q&A. So um, if there aren't any more, I'll pass it to you, Randy. Okay, well, I think you can see that in this example, the Shenandoah Mountain folks have really turned wilderness stewardship into a, a wonderful way of providing the dynamics in the community to get energy around a wilderness designation and for more stewardship for existing wildernesses and for future wilderness areas. So that's a really great example. Lynn and Tom, thank you so much. I think we're going to go ahead and take a break and um, resume the workshop at 